assuming that you're in a team, the next thing you need to do is have your team sign up for StockTrack. Okay? So very important, follow the link that is in the syllabus because that link will have our class information. So you have one member of your team, only one member, if you haven't already, click on that link, pay the $31.95, get reimbursed by the other team members. You'll choose a login and a password and essentially a team name. Now what's important about the team name is that when you log into StockTrack, right, and I've actually logged in a little bit earlier, refresh, log back in, then under my portfolio there's going to be a ranking and as the teams are signed up these will be the team names in the 443 sections. Now all the four of the 443 sections will eventually be on this list. So we could have 24 or 25 teams. What's going to matter is the seven teams in this section are going to compete against each other. So sometime next week after everybody has signed up and chosen their name then we'll adjust the names in the pages or the people section so that you'll know who the teams are in this section that you're competing against because your grade is based on how you do against the people in this section right other sections do not matter does that make sense questions about any of that okay all right so <clears throat> once you s sign up for stock track and again just please choose a name that is uh, safe for work all right because this is going to be publicly displayed then you can start your trading actually has already started. So you can start trading today, theoretically, if you immediately open up an account. So when you log in and you look at your portfolio, now I, I did some trades earlier today just to show how to use StockTrack, but you would start out with approximately $1 million worth of cash. right? And it'll be a little bit more than that because based on the day you sign up, it puts the money in a money market account so you get a little bit of interest even if you don't do any trades. Right? And then the next thing you can do is you'll have a million hypothetical dollars, but you'll actually have two million dollars worth of buying power because you can actually buy on margin. Right? And <clears throat> a couple of other restrictions. You, you'll notice up here under trading that there's a lot of other things that you can trade, but I've disabled all of them with the exception of stocks and mutual funds. Right? A couple more limitations. You cannot buy or sell a stock below $3 in price. This is not the Wolf of Wall Street. Okay? So no penny stocks. You have to buy or sell a stock with at least $3. Now, if you buy it for more than $3 and it drops below 3 you can sell it. Right? But there's no trading in penny stocks. Right? And you can't put more than 25% of your original million dollars into any one company. Right? So there's a little bit of forced diversification on the trading. Right? And I disabled day trading. So whatever you buy today, you can't sell until tomorrow, the next business day. Or whatever you short today, you can't cover until the next business day, until tomorrow. Right? Now every night, and it doesn't do this until the end of the night, when you go to rankings, it will rank all of the teams by the portfolio value. Right? In about five and a half weeks, when we hit the first milestone of stock track trading, your ranking on this page will determine your grade based on the people that are in this section, right? And you're really just playing against them. Now, I'm not really playing against you. I'm just kind of having some fun picking some stocks, but just to show you how it works. So let's say I want to come in here to trading. I go to stocks, and earlier today I bought some stocks. So what I'll do is I'll buy somebody else. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy Costco. So I either type in the ticker symbol or the company name, and then it'll give me a current price. So right now, Costco is trading at $143 a share. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy, I don't know, 3,000 shares of Costco. I can do a market order. I can do a limit order. <clears throat> um, I can do a good till cancel order. So if I do a limit order, I can say I can make a good until end of day, good until canceled, good until whenever. I can also put in a stop loss order. So, for example, if I buy Costco at 143, I can put another order that says sell it if it hits 135. So I have some downside protection, so it doesn't automatically, you know, just keep falling like a rock, and I'm not paying attention. So do pay attention to that, and then essentially preview my order, 
And then what it'll also tell me is this is a $431,000 order, which is more than the maximum $250,000 I can put in any one stock. So basically, if it doesn't allow you to do it here, you can't do it. If it allows you to do it here, then you can do it. Okay. So in this case, I got to reduce my order size. So I'll cut it to 2,000 shares of Costco. Okay. All right. I'll cut it to 1,800 shares, 1,700 shares of Costco. Still over 250,000. That's math. And then I will hopefully, once it refreshes, place my order. All right, and then you'll see that I'm now owner of Costco. And by the way, you can come up here, you can go to transaction history, and you can see the other transactions that you make. So earlier today, I bought a company called PVH, which is Calvin Klein, and I bought a company called Lindell Bissell, which makes plastics. So <clears throat> those are the, now the three companies that are in my portfolio, those two plus Costco. Got to make 10 trades each half of the semester, right, minimum. There's no maximum, well, theoretically 300 is the maximum, but the most anybody's ever made is 176. By the way, they did not come in first place. Right? So not saying you have to make a lot of trades, but it's up to you. Last point I'll make is it is up to your team to control who has access to the account. So you have one username and password to the account. The last two semesters, I've had two teams, one in each semester, that had a what's called a rogue trader. So one of the students went in, went crazy, lost a lot of money, and basically killed the team's grade. And there's nothing I can do to stop that. So it is your team's responsibility to determine who trades under what circumstances and how the team will self-monitor that. So again, as a team, discuss trading so you don't have somebody in there going crazy with the trading and the rest of the team has no idea that they're doing that. Right. So again, it is up to your team to manage that responsibly. Right? Questions about stock track? All right. <clears throat> so also a few more logistical items. Homework one. I had posted the solution onto Elms under the files section for homework one last week. And this is the solution. Now, the key is that your G might vary slightly depending on the day of the week that you did your assignment. So the way I explained to the TAs, I said assume slight variation of G and to kind of look to see if the PEs were consistent with the Gs that you submitted, knowing though that the G of Procter & Gamble isn't going to be like 4.5%. I mean, it, the trading range is pretty narrow, so the G is going to be somewhere around 3.7, 3.8. It's not going to be 4, 4.2, right? So essentially, that's basically the solution, hopefully pretty straightforward exercise. Questions about that? Okay. One of the reasons I wanted to do this, and you can see this clearly with Clorox, is Clorox has an absurd return on investment, return on equity of almost 389%, yet their multiple is actually lower than Estee Lauder. And so this is the thing. It's really the growth return combination that matters. This is the Apple example we talked about last week, where basically you have a situation where a company has a great return, but if it doesn't grow, then it's almost like a bond. Okay? So it just generates a consistent cash flow, but I don't pay a lot of value for the cash flow, so I have a lot of value, but I don't necessarily see a high multiple. So what matters is the growth return combination. But if I have an absurd spread, like Clorox does, if they had the same growth rate as Estee Lauder, notice that their multiple would be 52. Okay, So that's the point. If I have a high spread company, adding a little bit of growth onto that becomes very, very valuable. If I'm a high spread company, I'm not really growing that much, not going to get as much of a multiple. Right. So <clears throat> that's one of the things we can see here with Clorox. So just having a high spread does not guarantee a high multiple. It's the growth return combination. Right. And so in this case, Procter & Gamble is also a relatively good performing company. They have a pretty good growth rate, you know, better than Clorox, kind of call it in the middle, 
and they have a pretty good return, but this is the other thing that's important in this class. It's all about relative performance, right? It's not about absolute performance, right? Because if I'm investing in this industry, I'm actually going to prefer Estee Lauder over Procter & Gamble from an investor standpoint, right? Because Estee Lauder is getting more growth at a higher return. And even though Procter & Gamble is a great company, they are not doing as well as their peers. So relative performance is more important than absolute performance when we do valuation. Okay? Questions about that? All right. And then finally, you had homework two, which was due today. So if I went to Microsoft and I go to the RV section, go to custom, I created a custom template called HW2. That is basically the homework two solution. So you had to add in expected growth rate, operating ROIC, cycle time, WAC, and I added today operating spread for reasons we'll talk about in a few minutes, but basically you had to add those four things. And part of the reason why I had you do homework two is in advance of this week's classes, right? So it'll kind of help us with what we're about to talk about today. So that was homework two, creating some custom fields. Now just remember in Bloomberg, the custom fields that you create are available either in equity screening, EQS, or in RV. For some strange reason, they're not available in FA. Right? So what it means is you can do a custom field for current data, but you can't do it across a historical stream of data. It's just a limitation of Bloomberg. It's annoying. I've asked them about it for years. They just said deal with it. If you want to do historical data that's custom, you basically have to export it and do it yourself in Excel. So the custom fields do not work across the FA section. They only work in EQS and RV. Right? But nonetheless, this would be Microsoft's pure data for homework too. Yes. Um, in this case, oh, you mean using the Bloomberg Global Peers? To be honest with you, uh, that's a new checkbox that wasn't there before. <laughs> I was there just not last semester. So, um, in this case, I would say leave the checkbox checked, and if you had either one, we'll give you credit for it. You'll have slightly different numbers if you use the BI peers versus the non-BI peers uh -huh. for the weighted average, because it's going to only do the weighted average of the companies on the list. But in this case, I'll, I'll give two solutions to the TAs. However, what's important is you have to have the Bloomberg peers for the whole firm. Yeah, that would be an important part to the homework chip. All right. Finally... You see this top line which says market cap weighted average? That was in the settings, global settings. And they have some statistics. If you click on any of these statistics, including market cap weighted average, which you, if you forgot to check it, make sure it is checked. Because that way, any time you do an RV screen, market cap weighted average will always be there. And in this class, we will prefer market cap weighted average to straight averages. Because a straight average will distort the industry average for smaller firms, where the market cap weighted average will at least basically say if it's a small firm, it won't count as much in the weighting, right? Now, they can also have a bias the other way, because if we did like Walmart, Walmart is so big, you're almost like looking at Walmart as the industry. But that being said, we do want to use the market cap weighted average, right? So make sure that is checked. And this wasn't part of your homework assignment, but while I'm on the screen, make sure under Excel export mode, it says static data as opposed to dynamic link, right? Static data means that if you export the data to Excel, it's going to give you numbers, right? And if you do dynamic link, it's going to give you database lookups. So the advantage of dynamic links is if you export a template into Excel with dynamic links, every time you open up the file in Excel, it will pull the database in real time and refresh the data which is really cool until you leave the Bloomberg lab, in which case you open up your file and it just gives you errors and you see nothing. And so if you have dynamic links, you export that and you leave the lab, you submit that for your homework assignment, you'll get a zero on your homework assignment because you're just going to submit a bunch of errors. 
So it's very important to export data that is static, just because you won't have access to the Bloomberg terminals right, outside of this lab. So one thing you might just want to cha change is one of your default options. Right? That was homework too. Questions about that? All right. <clears throat> so today, what we're going to spend our time on this week is EIC. I posted lecture note two, and we're going to start going through lecture note two. And the idea of lecture note two of EIC is E stands for economy, I stands for industry, C stands for company, and <clears throat> the idea is, and I said this in the first day of class, that approximately half of a company's performance is going to be based on the industry it's in. Right? So EIC is a way of analyzing the external environment to get a better sense of the industry performance and more importantly to predict what could happen in the future to the industry's performance. Okay? So let's start out with the economy. If you've read any newspaper business headline in the last two weeks, then you can see that the stock markets have been driven by economic data. Right? That basically people are really getting nervous about the economy and as a result, for example, in Europe, bank stocks are getting crushed. In the U.S., IT stocks are getting crushed, right? And people are, you know, you see the NASDAQ, which is down to like, what, 4,000, something like that? Is it below 4,000 today? I'm trying to remember where the NASDAQ is. I'm sorry? Lost 3%. Yeah, the NASDAQ is just going down and down and down. In fact, let's do a quick look here in Google Finance. The NASDAQ is down to 4,200. Yeah, it's heading towards 4,000. So all I'm saying is that it's the economic industry data that's having a lot of impact on the marketplace. So with that in mind, let's go back to EIC. So when we do economic analysis of the EIC framework, we're really going to try and answer two questions this semester. Question number one is, how does the economic um, environment affect company performance, company and industry performance? All right? And the general idea is that when the economy is worse, there's going to be less cash flows for these industries and therefore the companies in the industries, and then they'll be less valuable. When the economy is better, then they will have more cash flows and be more valuable. All right? So two things. In Bloomberg, Stas probably showed you two screens. Showed you many screens, but two screens that are relevant to us. One is ECFC, which is economic forecasts. So we can go by country and we can see the economic data that's being forecasted for a particular country going forward. Okay? So if I'm looking at the US and companies that are tied to the US, then I can kind of get a sense of what's going to happen to the economic activity there. The other thing that Stas showed you was something called the Economic Surprise Index, ECSU. And this is for the U.S., but this is actually going to be the other basis for our economic analysis. And the idea here is this, that on the left-hand side are, are something like 40-odd economic indicators into six groupings and it's called the surprise index because there's kind of a baseline for expectation for what's going to happen to the economy. And then you can either have a negative or positive surprise as the data is released. And then what they show you is whether it was a positive or negative surprise when it was released and the daily stock chart of what happened to the S&P 500 index when the data came out that particular day. And so here's the idea, and this is over here on the right, is that when there's negative economic surprises that the S&P 500 generally goes down. And when there's positive economic surprises, the S&P 500 is generally going up. So think about this. It's just like the earnings estimates that we talked about before. If I have a baseline for the, the valuation of a market based on the economic conditions, and I've already put that into my valuation, and I wake up and I realize that I was too optimistic, then I have to cut back on my valuations because the industry is not going to be as good, the economy is not going to be as good as I thought. So it's really the economic surprises that matter more than the absolute forecast because the forecast is already built into the current price. And so that's really what the surprise index is telling us. 
So if you really want to see what's happening to the U.S. stock market in action, it's right here on the screen. Because five of the six buckets of economic activity have had huge negative surprises recently. With the exception of labor, which had better employment in the fourth quarter than people thought. But other than that, all the other economic data is not just worse, it's worse than expected. Right? And that's what's causing the chaos in the marketplace today. Right? So that's the idea, is that when we get more negative downtrends in the economic index news, we're going to see worse performance for companies. And then we see, in this case, S&P 500, proxy for the big companies we're analyzing this semester. We see good news, companies do better. So this is the loose correlation we're going to make this semester, which is companies are tied to the, sorry, industries are tied to the economy. So the next question is, how is an individual company tied to the overall S&P 500 index or to the industries? Well, how do we tie the performance of a company to the S&P 500 index? Is there a metric that allows us to do that? The answer is yes, there is. It's called what? Beta. Right? What is beta? Yeah. Between what? Yeah, so if I said a company has a beta of 1, what does it mean? Alright, if I said the beta is 1.5? And if the S&P 500 goes down 1%? So if a company has a higher beta than 1, that means it's going to go up faster and down faster than the general market. And if a beta of less than one, it means it's not going to go up or down as fast. And if it's one, it goes exactly with the, with the index. So here's the point. Transitive property. If the S&P 500 is going to be driven by economic conditions, then how does my company compare to the S&P 500? So in this case, if my beta is one, <clears throat> then I'm going to have the same S&P 500 sensitivity as the average company to changes in the economy. But... If my beta is 1.5, then I'm going to be a lot more sensitive to the economy. And if I'm 0.5, I'm going to be a lot less sensitive. So we're going to use beta as a proxy for the economic sensitivity of a company. Yes? Is there an example of a negative beta? Uh, insurance. Insurance is historically a negative beta. But here's the thing. We can go to the equity screening section of Bloomberg, and we can say for the was it SPX let's just see right now uh, whether beta will do beta uh, less than zero And the answer is, right now, in the S&P 500, there are no companies with a beta less than zero. Okay? So let's take out the S&P 500, and let's just look and see if there are beta. There are companies with betas less than zero. Uh, and we'll go to, I don't know, well, in the U.S., North America, United States. Okay. Oh. Why is it doing this? All right. Um, see if there's anybody in the U.S. less than zero. Anyways, but that would be the point. Is in the S&P 500 right now, there's not. So it's, you're really looking for a low beta. All right, taking too long on Bloomberg. We'll see if it comes back to us later. So, <clears throat> oh, let me just go here. Let's go back to our Microsoft example. Two ways to get beta. One is if you're on a company, on a Microsoft, just type in beta. And then it will actually calculate a real-time beta for you. Now, and you can see that the way they're doing it here, 
is they're plotting against the S&P 500 index. They're looking at, in this case, weekly data right here. So look at the weekly change of the S&P 500, weekly change of Microsoft, scatter diagram, draw a trend line, slope of that trend line, raw beta. So Microsoft's raw beta right now, 1.371. Right? So we know that Microsoft is going to be much more economically sensitive than the average company. Right? So let's translate. If I go back to Microsoft stock price and I look at the last month, then we can see that Microsoft has taken a big hit in stock price recently. They've gone from 55 down to 48. And if I were to look at other securities, and if I were to add, as an example, the S&P 500 during this exact same period of time, then what I can see in my little study here is that Microsoft has actually gone down probably looks like a little bit more than the S&P 500. Okay, so that's the point that I want to make is that during this period of time, Microsoft has done worse than the S&P 500, which is, I know it's a very short term period, but the idea is that if I'm looking at an economic sell-off in the marketplace, all right, what's happening is people are saying that the tech stocks, which are really getting hammered, which are the high beta stocks, which are more sensitive to the economy, are the ones that are going to get pummeled even more. Right? Because think about this quantitatively, or sorry, qualitatively, which is Microsoft sells IT services and software to companies. And companies are going to be the ones more likely to cut back and defer, not that they'll stop IT spending to zero, but they're going to slow down more in, in recessionary periods. They're going to defer their CapEx. They're going to defer the big IT systems. They're going to make people live with their computers a little bit longer. This is what the market is essentially saying is happening in the tech sector. And again, that's what the high beta is representing here, back to the economic conditions. Right? But here's the flip side of this. If we're in a tough economic environment and suddenly people start thinking things are going to get better in the future, Microsoft's going to be one of the first companies I'm going to want to buy. Because as people expand their wallets, then it's those high beta stocks that tend to do better over time. Right? So again, economic sensitivity. Now, what would be another way of looking at this is if I go to the RV screen, I can go to the comp sheets, sorry, markets, and there's a sub-tab called beta, and it actually gives me the beta for Microsoft and its peers. It also gives me a market cap weighted average, which gives me essentially the idea of an industry beta. All right. So if I look at Microsoft's peers on this list, and I'm looking at the raw beta column, is the software industry more or less sensitive to the economy? More. So that's something i got to worry about if I'm evaluating software. Is Microsoft more or less sensitive to the software industry? Who's going to be more sensitive to economic changes? The average firm in the industry or Microsoft? Microsoft. That's also an, another important point to know. Okay, so I kind of want to know the industry beta, and I want to know the company against the industry. Now, you'll also notice in Bloomberg there's something called the adjusted beta. And by default, Bloomberg uses adjusted beta. So if you do Cap M, you do WAC, they use adjusted beta. What adjusted beta is, you can see the formula right on the screen. It's two-thirds of the raw and one-third of one. So the adjusted beta basically just puts in a regression coefficient because the idea is that statisticians believe in regression to the mean. So what they do is they just move the beta one-third closer to the mean, whatever the mean is. All right, and that's the idea of an adjusted beta. So for purposes of this class, I don't want to get into an academic debate because there is no right answer of whether we should use the raw or the adjusted. I'm just going to say for purposes of economic analysis, I'm choosing raw, right? And the reason why I'm choosing raw is because I, if I want to know the economic sensitivity, I want to know exactly how a company is changing against the index in terms of making the economic sensitivity determination. So Bloomberg will use adjusted beta for the WAC, that's fine, but we're going to use raw when we talk about adjust economic sensitivity. Questions about any of that? That's the E part of your homework assignment that you're going to have to do this week. 
right? Let's talk about the eye. So the next part is industry analysis. And I want you to think about the industry analysis differently than you probably have in the past. And so in this class, <clears throat> as I was joking with the other classes, <clears throat> we don't give performance awards to companies, right? Everybody doesn't just do well, right? In the real world, it's relative performance, right? Or as, as the joke that I gave with Star Wars is the old Yoda saying, you know, there is no try. You either do or you don't. Okay, so basically there was a Super Bowl last night. There was a winner, there was a loser, right? And that's the way we need to look at it. It wasn't like, oh, they made the Super Bowl, that's great. So in finance, it's all about relative performance. So we're going to care a lot about relative performance, and that's how we're going to score people. So when we talk about the attractiveness of an industry, number one, an attractive industry is going to be financially attractive. Number two, we're going to score it based on spread. So an attractive industry is going to be an industry that is positive NPV, which means it's going to have a positive spread. So ROIC versus WAC is an indication of an attractive industry, right? And that is the way we're going to define an attractive industry, right? Because it's based on the concept of NPV. Second, companies. Companies can do well because they're an attractive industry has nothing to do with whether they have competitive advantage, right? So I also want you to define competitive advantage differently in this class than you have in other classes, right? So the definition that I want us to use for competitive advantage is this one, performance relative to peers, right? So if you're in an attractive industry but you're not outperforming your peers, you could be doing well because you're in an attractive industry. It doesn't mean you're a great company. Right? So to be a great company, you have to consistently outperform your peers. Right? So back to oil. When oil was $100 a barrel, it didn't matter. You, you could know nothing about oil. You could buy land in North Dakota. You could hire a few experts and go dig a well, and you could make money and still have a really good return because the oil price was so high and so forgiving, it was really easy to make money in the industry. Right? When oil is down to $30 a barrel, it's a completely different story. That unless you really know what you're doing, you're going to struggle. And even the people that really know what they're doing are going to struggle. So then it's very important to look at, again, the relative performance, not the absolute. So here's the point. Let's go back to the Microsoft example. If I use the BI peers, which is this entire list, and I go to our custom homework two, so I had to do homework two, and I added on to this to make life easier. You guys created an operating spread. So you can just hit add column and then add operating spread to your homework to a tab. tab. <clears throat> That's this one over here, which is basically ROIC minus WAC. Or an operating ROIC minus WAC. Is this list of companies, is this an attractive industry? Given the definition of industry attractiveness that I just gave, is this an attractive industry? Yes or no? Yeah, it's got a 44% spread. It's a hugely attractive industry. Does Microsoft demonstrate today competitive advantage? So attractive industry, now looking at Microsoft, competitive advantage, yes or no? Why? Why can you say yes? Yeah, because they're making a 51% spread in an industry making a 44% spread. Everybody see that? So Microsoft is actually demonstrating some competitive advantage. All right, look at um, Oracle, big database company. Is Oracle creating value? They're the second from the bottom. Is Oracle creating value? Does Oracle demonstrate competitive advantage? Why not? Yeah. 
So what I would say is Oracle is a good company, right? Don't get me wrong. But Oracle is also a good company because they're in a great industry, right? Software and IT services are just a great industry. And they're a good company in a great industry. But they're not currently demonstrating huge competitive advantage versus the industry compared to some of their peers financially, right? And so that's what I'm saying. That's the way you need to start thinking about this. That Oracle happens to be in the right place at the right time. Oracle is not really outperforming a lot of its peers given these financial characterizations. Therefore, I don't consider Oracle to have true competitive advantage versus their peers. Right? It's a different definition than you would use in a strategy class. Right? This is not the strategy class. So going back to this, um, who else in this list has competitive advantage? Yeah, I don't know what checkpoint is, but they obviously are doing something right. Anybody else? Not that we see. Right? So let me just pull up another industry. So I'm going to pull up DuPont. DuPont is, by the way, merging with Dow Chemical. It's a chemical industry. Is the chemical industry attractive or not? Well, but we're not using cycle time yet to define industry attractiveness. Is this an attractive industry? How can you say no? All right. So I only have a slightly positive NPV, therefore I'm destroying value? I only have a slightly NPV, therefore I am still creating value, therefore it's an attractive industry. So is it as attractive as software? I agree. It's not. But this is still an attractive industry because it has a positive spread. So we're going to start to relatively rank. Some industries are more attractive than others, but this is still an attractive industry because it has a positive spread. So start with the idea of NPV. If it has a positive spread, it has a positive NPV, it can be considered a, an attractive industry. All right? Second question, does DuPont have competitive advantage currently? Are they demonstrating competitive advantage? Yes or no? They have an identical spread to the industry. Therefore, DuPont is not basically, they're just, as you said, they're just going with the industry. They are an, an average player in a slightly above average industry. Right? Which, given that everybody else is doing a lot better, I'm not all that excited about. But the point is, that's the point. They're not demonstrating competitive advantage. Is there somebody demonstrating competitive advantage in this industry? Yeah. Who? Yeah, WR Grace could be one of them. They're at twenty percent. Uh, now this is a global list. Why it switched to a global list, I don't know. But nonetheless, so I'll uncheck this and I'll just go back to the U.S. for the time being. Make it a simpler list to look at. Look at the U.S. peers. Outside of WR Grace, there's no one in this industry doing well, right? In fact, you have to go outside the U.S. to find chemical companies who are actually reasonably doing well. And that's one of the challenges that, that's causing Dow and DuPont to want to merge. Yes? It just means that Bloomberg can't calculate it for whatever reason. So it may be negative or just may just be missing data in one of the custom fields that we created, unfortunately. All right. One other quick one. I was looking at McDonald's with the previous class, so I'll do it with you guys. What about McDonald's? That's casual. Is this an attractive industry, yes or no? Yes. Does McDonald's have competitive advantage? No. That's the point. McDonald's is actually doing well because they're in a fast casual business that is actually doing well. All right? I wouldn't say that McDonald's is doing well because they're necessarily doing a lot better than their peers. Matter of fact, if I look at some of their peers, Starbucks, competitive advantage? Sure. Panera? Panera? No. Avoid Chipotle because of their whole E. coli scare, but Chipotle, up until recently? Yes. Right? So 
as I said, I want you to think about it this way when you define competitive advantage. Right? Questions about those definitions, how we're using it. Right? And by the way, last but not least, XOM. Here's Exxon Mobil. Oil and gas. Is this at 30 something? This is actually last year. So this is like, you know, $40 oil. Is big oil an attractive industry? No, it's a horrible industry right now. Okay? So that's the point. Now, here's something really interesting. Does anybody on this list demonstrate competitive advantage? Who demonstrates competitive advantage on this list? Imperial oil. All right? I like to call this the queen of the pigs. All right? So they just happen to suck less than the total suckage of the entire industry. So this industry sucks, but they're doing something so that they suck less, hence can still have competitive advantage. So the point of competitive advantage, as we will look at it in this section, is that we're going to look at competitive advantage as relative performance. So you could be in a bad industry, but be a good company relative to your peers. You can also be a great company, but not be creating as much value as some of your peers because you're in such a good industry. So again, competitive advantage is about relative performance. Industry performance is about absolute level of value created. Now, again, back to the readings in the book. If you haven't read the book, second half of these lecture notes, I'm not going to get to, and they'll be very important for next week, which talks about how to do <coughs> um, DCF and economic profit valuation methodologies. I'm assuming that the book does a good job of covering it. I'm not going to talk about it in the lecture notes. We're not going to have time. But one of the other things that the book does talk about, which is important to understand, is this is a slide right out of the book. And what it shows you is that over time, different industries had different levels of ROIC. This is like a 40-year period of time. It showed the ranges of industry. But that was the point. This is what I'm showing you in Bloomberg. Some industries are more attractive than others, right? And that's just the nature of the game, which means we have to come up with an explanation about why an industry is more attractive than another industry. And we will say that industries are, back to your point, are more or less attractive than its peers. Now, before I do that, though, there's two other slides in the book I wanted to mention to you. This slide should be burned in the back of your brain if you're ever going to be a finance person for the rest of your life, right? <clears throat> what this slide basically shows you is that over time, no matter who you are, it is difficult to maintain high ROIC. If you're, and what McKinsey does, they broke companies into quintiles of ROIC performance, proxy for spread. And they basically said, buy and hold. What happens every year out to companies that were in the top quintile of ROIC for publicly traded companies? And the answer is, over time, you see regression to the mean no matter who you are. Right? And this is why I could say comfortably in the beginning of class that no matter how good Apple was doing, this is what they're facing over time. You're not going to state this level of high performance forever. It just doesn't happen. That's why I can say Google. No matter how well Google, who's now the world's most valuable company, is doing, they're not going to maintain it forever. In fact, it was funny that there was a newspaper article last year that said Apple was going to be the first trillion dollar company. They have now replaced it and recycled the exact same newspaper article that says Google will be the first trillion dollar company. Right? And I'm telling you, neither one of them will be the first trillion dollar company. I'm not saying there's not a small probability this could happen, but I think it's unlikely for this reason. And I'm not saying that Google's not great, but to maintain the level of performance that they're doing at this level for 10 to 15 years as a big company gets to be very, very difficult. And that just should be our bias. Our bias is it's the exception, not the rule, to have great performance forever. It can happen, but it's very rare. Right? The opposite is also true. It's actually difficult to sustain poor performance for long periods of time. Now, by the way, to be very clear, these are big publicly traded companies, the, the S&P 500, right? And the reason is it's Darwinian because what happens is you take a company like Jay-Z Penny and they struggle, and so what happens is they get starved of capital. They get the Raiders come in and they change the board, right? They force them to focus on their strategy. They cut a bunch of staff. 
They force them to improve their performance. Not saying J.C. Penney is suddenly going to look like you know Nordstrom's or Costco overnight, but the flip side is they are going to start to improve their performance over time, or they're going to go away. And the odds are, if you're a big company that's established that you know what you're doing, then you'll probably improve over time. This is not startups. You start a startup of capital that's underperforming, they just go away. Right? They won't make it. Right? These are talking about big established companies, which are the ones we're looking at in this class. But understand that there is this regression of the mean bias. This is the other bias you should have. McKinsey did the same thing on what they called revenue growth decay analysis. And what they said is if you bought companies, again, the S&P 500 based on quintiles, and you buy and hold, that revenue growth decays a lot faster. And the reason? Law of large number effect. All right? And I'll go back to, to Google. This is the challenge that Google's going to have. It's right here on this chart. Is law of large numbers. That when you look at a company, or I should be calling them Alphabet, this is the problem that Alphabet's going to have. When you look at a company like Alphabet, and you look at the size of Alphabet when they start to get to 85 billion, 95 billion, 103 billion of revenue, that revenue growth rates are going to go from 19 to 16 to 13 to 8 because it is no different than this chart. It's the revenue decay that the law of large numbers become harder and harder to grow at the same rate as you get bigger. All right. So but the thing is, with bigger companies, that decay is much faster than the ROIC. And we got to remember this when we do forecasting. That's why, as I said, to me, it is no surprise that China is having the issues it's having today because I've always known this chart exists and everybody seems to ignore this. It is to me not a surprise that Apple is having the challenges they have today because I've always known this chart. Everybody seems to ignore this. What I want you guys to do this semester is to not ignore this. So you are at least aware that these, these situations come up repetitively again and again and again. And you should be looking at this when you think about valuation. All right. So the other thing that's going to matter, back to your homework assignment, is this is that, as I said, some industries are more attractive than others. So we have to have a way to explain industry attractiveness. Right? And again, we're defining industry attractiveness as spread. So a way to explain the spread of the industry. Now, all of you have done Michael Porter's Five Forces probably in a previous class. So we're going to use Five Forces as a way of explaining the spread. Right? So there are five forces, buyer, supplier, substitutes, entry and exit, rivalry to get you an overall level of performance. And in this class, we're going to use an arbitrary five-point scale, arbitrary made up, to define industry attractiveness. And on our scale, a three is going to mean zero spread. A four or five is going to mean positive spread. And a one or two is going to mean negative spread. And you can get granular if you want to go like 1, 1.5, 1.75, whatever. But that gets back to the point that was brought up earlier. Hey, when we looked at Microsoft and then when we jumped to DuPont, I might call Microsoft a 5 and I might call DuPont like a 3.2. Okay, So some industries are more attractive. They both create value. But relatively, I'd rather invest in an industry that looks like a 5 than an industry that looks like a 3.2 on a 5-point scale when it comes to industry attractiveness. Right? So... I want to be able to judge industries based on that score. So that's the overall level of industry attractiveness. So let's go back to this industry. Here was, who were we looking at a second ago? McDonald's. Here's McDonald's. Here is what's it? RV. Here is Spread. One to five, fast casual. This industry makes 31% ROIC. Again, historically, the best industry over a very long period of time averaged around 40 of operating ROIC. And the average company was around 10. 
And fast casual right now is at 30. So what do you want to score that? All right, call it a four and a half. All right, so this is a pretty darn attractive industry. We'll call that a four and a half. All right, everybody with me on that? Okay, so here's the next piece. For each one of these forces, we have to score the forces. So, in fact, I'll do this in Excel, make it even easier. Okay, so what were they? We had buyer, supplier, substitute, entry and exit, rivalry, overall. We have to, using those other five forces, explain why this is such an attractive industry. Now, it's not a pure average, because some forces could matter more than the others, but which of the five forces explain why fast casual is such a great business? Yeah. So would that help or hurt the spread? So you said the power of the buyers is high, which means we have a lot of choice. So therefore, oh, no, no, I'm saying like the, the market itself is big enough, like the amount of buyers. So there's a lot of buyers, yeah. and there's actually so many buyers that the choices that we have don't really matter too much. Yeah. Okay. So here's the point, and this is initially counterintuitive, but will become extremely intuitive when you actually think about it. The way I want you to score each force is not whether or not that force is strong, but I want you to score the force as to how that impacts the spread of the industry. So does buyer power, as you define it, help the spread, four or five, hurt the spread, one or two, cause the spread to not really matter, three? Do you think it's going to hurt the spread or help the spread? So four or five. So here's the point. Even though you think buyer power is weak because there's so many people, out there that they're not really having to fight too much for customers very hard, then you're saying that the buyers don't have a lot of power and therefore the industry is doing well. So in this case, low buyer power doesn't mean a low score. Low buyer power means good spread, which means high score on this table. So we're tying everything to the impact on spread as we do this. So give me a number again for that. Okay. If you say three, you're telling me... No, I said 4.3. .3. Oh, 4.3. Okay, oh, I'm sorry. I said four or three. Oh, I was like, okay. So 4.3. By the way, if we just went down the list and used 4.3 for all of this, would that be a problem? Yes. You can't call the industry a 4.5, use the scale we're doing, and have every number below 4.5. Like, at least something on that list has to explain the 4.5, right? So it's not additive. You don't add the list together. You look at each of the items as whether something is explaining it. So getting back to his 4.3, assuming we agree with his 4.3, what force explains the 4.5? What's so great? About fast food, fast casual. Yep. So, which which of these would you put that under? Okay. Well, it's called entry exit, right? So, give me a score for that one. Okay. So again, I'll give you an example of this. So, last Tuesday. Um, I was stuck in Minneapolis because there was a blizzard there, which is why I wasn't here for Stas' presentation last Wednesday. So on a spur of the moment, because I was going to be trapped until late Wednesday night, <clears throat> there was an ACDC concert in Vegas, so I went to go see ACDC last Friday. And it was exciting because I got to go to my favorite fast food place in the whole wide world in Vegas. Anybody know what that is? For fast food. In-N-Out Burger. All right, In-N-Out Burger is great. And everybody, either you know in and out and you know how great it is, or you're like, I have no idea what, they, what they're talking about. But here's the point. 
in now burgers only in the desert southwest. They're in California. They're in Nevada. They're a little bit in Arizona. They got a couple in Texas, and that's it. You just don't get them on the East Coast. And it's not that they're not popular, and it's not that they're not you know valuable. It's just so expensive to build out national chains, right? And I think that's the point that you're seeing here is that believe it or not, when you think about true national brands for fast food, it's really not that many of them, right? And that gives companies like the McDonald's, the Wendy's, the Burger Kings, the Taco Bells, a lot of power because there aren't that many national chains. And in a way, going back to your, your choice, there's so many consumers and there's not that many national chains. It A, is a barrier to becoming a national chain and B, they tend to do well. And that's why when they compete, they generally don't compete on price. I mean, look at the prices that you pay. They're all pretty high. What they compete on is what? I'm sorry? Quality, to some degree. Taco Bell, horse meat, I don't know. Chipotle, E. coli, I worry about that. But yeah, you can argue quality. Or what else do they compete on? I'm sorry? Cost. No, I don't think they compete on price. I really don't. Yeah, there's uniqueness to the food, or they compete on bundles. They'll bundle things together, right? And by the way, the worst performing thing financially at a fast food restaurant is the burger. They don't make any money in the burger. They make 90% margins in the fries and the drink. So that's the point. They bundle the burger, the fry, and the drink because that's where they make the money, and it's all margin. The drink costs them like five cents. The fries cost them like five cents. All right. The burger actually does cost like a dollar or something, or the chicken sandwich is the expensive part. So that's the point. They bundle all these things together. And they tend not to compete on price. Now, that is slightly changing. Because if you look at the most recent data in the marketplace, we've had bad economic news, bad economic news, more price sensitivity. Who started the price wars in fast food? This is recent. It was, uh, is it Wendy's or Burger King? Who is the five for five? Is that Wendy's? And then Burger King has the four for four or something like that? I mean, Wendy's is four for four, Burger King is five for five, and McDonald's has the two for two, pick two or whatever. <clears throat> so basically, all I'm saying is, very recently, they've actually started to try to compete more on price, which is now what they've been historically doing the last few years. So here's the next thing. As you do your analysis, what matters more to me is what happens in five years. So do your baseline forecast now, and then tell me whether or not these forces are going to change in five years. Because the real answer to your homework is what's going to be the spread of this industry in five years. So when I look at fast casual, is fast casual going to have a positive spread of 24% five years from now? Is it going to actually stay about the same? Is it going to regress towards the mean? Is it going to get worse? And what would cause it to stay the same or get worse or maybe even get better? Because if it gets worse, then competitive advantage is going to matter a lot more. Because I'm going to care about the companies that have competitive advantage. I'm really going to want to focus on them. If it's going to stay about the same, then I probably want the growth companies. Because I want the companies that are going to get pretty good spread with a lot of growth. So essentially, that's what's going to eventually drive our company decisions. But we have to make some determination of what happens in the industry. So here's the point. Rather than directly forecasting spread, I want you to use the five forces to explain the current spread. Forecast the change in the five forces which then infers what the forecasted spread will be. That's what you're going to have to do on your homework assignment. Okay? Questions about that? All right. So, going back to your analysis, give me a number for buyer power in five years. So you called it a 4.3 today. Do you think the buyers will have more or less power or about the same five years from now for the fast food industry? And why? So I'm going to ask him first. I'll, I'll let you go. Let's say that buyers will have uh, slightly more, only slightly. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they have more choices. Why? Because I think that, like you said, even though it is hard to build these chains up, eventually in five years there might be one or two that may have expanded nationally. Okay. So give me a, a relative score so I understand the impact you're talking about. Uh, like a 3.6. Okay. 
Again, we're predicting the future, so there's not a right answer. But what's important when you work on your homework this week is that you give your logic, you give your rationale, and particularly data to back it up. Sorry, you were going to make a... Oh, I, I think it's more. It's not you, like bad, it's so you're also below 4.3 in the future? Yeah. What would your number be? Um, maybe like a 3.5. So you're in the same boat. You think it's going to be tougher for yeah. the industry? Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. Go ahead. I think So that that also will blend the forces because at that point you're starting to get in what you might even call a substitute. Yeah. So the substitutes might become more prevalent, which could give the buyers more choice, and so the substitutes could tie in with the buyer power to make it a tougher industry. So that's another key to talking about substitutes. And by the way, there's another substitute besides organics that I think they have to worry about. What are the other substitutes that could get tougher for this industry in the next five years? I mean, they have the um, like fake meat now. Like they're they're like it's like fake meat manufactured uh, beef. Like okay. They, they already started, and it's like edible, and it tastes like beef now. Um, but like they, it's like made sounds kind of scary to be honest it, with you. It's like made in a lab or something, so it's more <laughs> sustainability. All right, that, I don't know if we're going to get there in five years, but maybe. I don't, I don't know. Who knows? I was thinking about something even more simple, though, as a substitute. Yeah. Well, potentially delivery. More delivery options. If you see the people like Uber and Lyft getting into delivering food cheaply to people's houses. But I think even more practical. Been to a grocery store recently? Frozen. Not just the frozen foods, the delis. Go to a Whole Foods. Go to a Safeway. They're all pushing prepared meals. So that you can actually get a better quality meal that's less bad for you that you can just bring home already prepared. And so I think the grocery stores are responding as a way to take advantage of the fast casual trend with a little bit more upscale meal than you might get at a McDonald's. Which could also increase their margins. Absolutely. So as I said, what's key is beyond your scoring to give some rationale and ideally to use some data. So to help you in this, last piece, if you go to VBIC, which is off of Elms, you can get there. Under the industry section, there's something called IBIS World. And if you haven't used IBIS World before, IBIS World is industry reports. And in the industry reports is a five forces analysis. So again, this is a real world class. You're perfectly able to use real world data for this, right? You don't have to do everything yourself. However, don't plagiarize, right? So if you do reference something else, cite it, right? Don't plagiarize it. It's okay as long as you cite it. But that's the point. If you go to VBIC and you look up an industry, so or type of company, so I type in McDonald's, for example, it'll tell me what reports they're in. And if I look at fast food in the U.S., basically under industry performance and industry outlook are basically the five forces for today and in the future. And by the way, if you go over here to key statistics, they'll talk about growth rates for the industry going forward. All right, so again, valuable data that will help you in your assignment. All right, so what's going to happen, again, about 4.30 this afternoon, is when homework three becomes available, you're going to basically as individuals – you're going to have to do an economic analysis using what we talked about earlier. You're going to have to do a five forces assessment on the spread. So you're going to get the spread template back out. And you're going to have to talk about the attractiveness of the industry today and in five years. And then you're going to have to use some additional logic and rationale to tell me what stocks you think will do better given all that analysis that you would invest in. And you're going to have to write this up in a three to 500 word paper. I forgot how many words I said it was going to be. But it's all in the assignment. So it's actually kind of a major assignment to put all these pieces together. But nonetheless, it, it is a good way to tie it all together. All right. Now, next Monday, we're going to get into economic statement conversion, and we're not going to have time this week to talk about the rest of the lecture notes today, which is really the reading on how to set up a DCF valuation, how to set up an EP valuation. So please read the book for that. Next Monday, you are going to need to do 
probably helpful to have Excel with you. There's not enough computers in this room for everybody to have Excel, so a few of you might want to bring your laptops or tablets because when we do economic conversion, it might be helpful to do some practice in class as we're going through this rather than just the homework assignments. So that will just be one thing that would be helpful. And then the last thing that probably hasn't changed in the last couple hours since we did the earlier version of this class, um, I did look up the weather. And earlier today, there's a winter storm warning for tomorrow. I've made notice the, the most recent weather. See if they've updated it. So they've gone from a couple of flurries to uh, four to eight inches of snow tomorrow, particularly worse in the northern and western suburbs. And so I, I have a feeling there's a good chance you might have some classes canceled tomorrow. And depending on the timing of the snow, it could impact us on Wednesday. So what I told the previous classes is that what I'm going to do with homework three is Wednesday in advance of this, and maybe the weather forecast is just you know blowing this out of proportion, but this is kind of new in the last few hours. But basically for Wednesday, <clears throat> um, Bloomberg Lab Day. So we're not going to do a lecture because I live in the northern suburbs and I could get trapped up there too. So basically I'm going to make the homework available today. You have class time on Wednesday to do it. If you're snowed out on Wednesday, you have between now and next Monday to do homework three. So I'm going to make homework three available today, give you class time in lieu of the snow day, because it's a bigger homework assignment anyways, to apply what we've done. Make sure, and this is key, you do the readings in advance of next week, because as I said, we're going to do economic statement conversion next Monday, and that one, if you're not prepared for it, you could really struggle with. So if nothing else, read the chapters on economic statement conversion. All right, questions about any of that? Okay, see everybody next Monday at this point.